one of my English teachers in high school once said the sign of a great mind, a great person, is the ability to look past the particulars of your own experience and look at the general principles that apply to everybody. You say you're disappointed in love. You see it in general terms. It's not you're not the only person to whom it's happened. And what makes us human in the larger sense is our ability to see past the particular. So what does it mean? The fact that there is this drive to want to be connected with someone else, and yet it's constantly frustrated by impermanence. What's to be done about this? You can think about it in your own particular terms. You might say, well, just find somebody else. Or you can start thinking about the larger patterns of human life. The same applies to any kind of separation, any kind of loss. This is one of the things that made the Buddha great. He, instead of dealing with large abstractions, he looked at the particulars of his life and was able to see through them to the general principle that was common to all experience. Where there's birth, there's aging, illness, death, and separation. These things all go together, and there's no way around it. If you keep on living an ordinary life, these questions, what can be done about this? We saw that the seeds of the problem didn't lie outside. They lay inside. If the nature of reality is one way, but what you want out of it is something else entirely, maybe you've got to look at your wants. What can you do about those? Now, some people said, well, the choice is simply between following your desires or totally denying your desires for true happiness. And he was, find he was able to find a third way out which was, on the one hand, looking at the nature of reality, the fact that it's governed by cause and effect. And on the other hand, how far can you push those laws of cause and effect? Can you work with them in such a way that they open up to a true happiness? And so that was the happiness he pursued, and that's how he pursued it. And that's how he came up with the answers that he found, by looking at the larger issues and seeing his life in the perspective of those larger issues, and then finding a realistic solution. What's interesting about his story is that he's, he didn't look at it solely at his own problems in life. He looked at life in general. He said, looking at aging people, ill people, dead people, he realized that he himself was subject to the same fate. He was going to get old, he was going to go ill, and he was going to die. And so if he had any disdain for people like that, then it wasn't appropriate. And if he was following a, pursuing a happiness that was looking in the direction of what would age, grow ill, and die, that too wasn't appropriate. The feeling that overcomes you when you think about these things is sangwega. It's different from grief. Grief is personal. Sangwega is impersonal. It's universal. And it's interesting that in his later teachings, when the Buddha talks about overcoming grief, the way out of grief is through Sangwega. You look at the happiness you gain out of the objects of the senses, and that includes peoples, includes relationships. 
see the grief that comes when the happiness you had from these things changes. And instead of trying to turn from that grief by looking for pleasure in the senses, which is what most people do, they think that's the only alternative. You really let yourself think about the universality of all this. And that's what allows you to turn yourself, turn your thoughts in another direction. What is it in the mind that keeps giving rise to this spark that desires birth? He said that's the cause of suffering, this drive for becoming. I was talking this evening to someone about the Buddhist take on happiness. Normal happiness is based on feeding. And he was saying, well, the solution is to have lots of different food sources, so that if one food source is denied, you have lots of others to fall back on. But that's really blind. There come points where you can't have all those other food sources. What do you do then? This is why the Buddhist solution is to look for a happiness that doesn't depend on food sources. And of course, by food, we hear more than just physical food, emotional food. The food of sensory contact, the food of our thoughts, the food of consciousness. All these things can dry up. They can all be threatened. So you have to look for a happiness that lies outside of their range. And it was the Buddhist discovery that, that there is such a happiness and it can be attained through human effort. This is what takes you on beyond Sangwega and onto a term called basada, which means conviction, confidence. A sense of inspiration in the path. And that's traversal from individual grief through Sangwega to confidence is a necessary part of the path as well. It's the emotional side of the path. It's what gives impetus to the practice. Because without it, the practice simply becomes a means of stress control, stress management. And you dabble in it enough to calm yourself down, relax a little bit, and then go back to your old ways, which is not a solution. It's just a band-aid. Many times the Theravada path sounds very intellectual, but there's this emotional component as well. When you face disappointment, when you face separation, when you face grief, this is the way out, learning how to reflect on the, the general principles, the universality of grief, of separation. And that's what gives, gives you the impetus to pursue the path with the ardency that it requires. <laughs>